Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your kindness to us and your grace, your mercies, which are new every day. Father, we just pray as we study your word that you'd give us good internet connection, that we'd be able to continue our Bible study and revelation. Father, I pray for this uh, COVID pandemic right now in the U.S. and Canada and also especially in the Philippines. I pray that you would just um, work and we, we pray that you'd spare life and also that you would give leaders um, wisdom, that they would make wise decisions um, and that they would they would do the do what's right, not what's political or what's best for them, but what's what's right and and true before you. Father God, I just pray now that you bless this time and that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your word says. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Um, I'm sorry for this the situation here. What I want to do is I'm just going to read chapter 10 because the two the ch chapter 10 part one is connected with chapter 10. Uh, one to seven is connected with chapter 10, eight to 11. So what I'll do is I'll just read the whole chapter and then our focus will be on the, on the second half on verses eight to 11. So the word of God says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. And his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced it to his prophets. Verse eight, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll and from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it in my stomach, it made my stomach bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. The word of the Lord. So, <laughs> a very powerful passage, incredibly challenging to us. Let me go ahead and bring up my um, the text here that we can investigate. So, this might actually be better. I'm in dark mode, so I don't know if you like dark mode or not, but maybe it'll be better for our, our, our lag. Let's go ahead and let's look at the passage, and it's connected with verses 1 to 7. You have the mighty angel that's present in, verse, in, 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 in chapter 10, verses 1 to 7, continuing here. Let's make some observations or ask questions about about the passage before us. What are your observations? What are your connections with the previous passage? So we have a voice that's, all, that's mentioned in um, Revelation 10, one to seven. So the voice is, is, is continuing. We also have the hand of the angel so again, um, this is also connected with the previous context. So that's going back up. What are your questions or observations? Does anyone want to make one? I, 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 I just, I'm just noting that this is the second time a mighty was associated with an angel. The first one was with, uh, I think the one with the angel with the loud voice or booming voice yeah okay great this so let's, is, let's yeah so mighty angel is this a special class of angels we we talked about the that and yeah so i'm sorry raul you cut out yeah we talked about that this is that this is most likely a special class of angels um so the the the, the discussion 
Some people say it's a special class. Luigi, do you want to share with, with Raul what you shared with me as far as the, the, the study that you did concerning this angel, Luigi? Well, yeah, the only thing I did was I, I checked, I did a, I looked up and, and there was, it, it said the uh, means messenger. So yeah. a mighty messenger. So in, in a way you could argue that it may not really be an angel, but a messenger. So that's maybe the special class that you're, you're uh, referencing, Tim. Well, didn't you say that it was Jesus? Didn't you bring up that, that, that some of them were saying it was Jesus Christ? No, I was saying uh, based on, on the mighty messenger and that, you know, he, he said he swore to God, the father. Yeah. That, that kind of leads me to believe that it, you know, it's, it's, it's referencing Jesus, but I know, I mean, I, I, I'm still kind of, Kind of on the fence, but I'm leaning towards. No, that's good, Luigi. But 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 um, yeah, that's really good. But uh, so just from seeing the description. So for example, the angel is is number one. He's mighty. Yeah. Number two, he has authority. Anyway, so we have we have authority. We have there's a, a position of authority. He also has the scroll in his hand. So what people will say is that this is, this is suggesting that the angel is, in fact, Jesus Christ. Just to recap, for those who just entered, we're talking about this angel that has, that has a scroll, that has a scroll in his hand, and he's also standing. So this is a description here. He's standing on the land and the sea. And so it is a very, verses one to seven describe it as mighty. And so what we've been saying is that could be Jesus Christ. That's one interpretation. Um, and then other people will just say, no, it can't be Jesus Christ. We can talk about this later. This just, this has to just be a, a special class. At least the, the identification is this, this special class. It could be Jesus Christ. Anyone else want to make an observation? We're looking right now at verse eight. Anyone else want to make an observation? Okay, Kuyaro, go ahead. I, I, I tend to uh, were the special class because it seems, it seems that throughout the good book, um, important announcements uh, were made by special kinds of angels. Um, for example, um, the announcement of the birth of Christ it was announced by an angel and other cases like Abraham and Sarah and, and all the other um, 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 angels who, who are designated as messengers that deliver special messages, whether it's a joyous messenger or it's a messenger as a message of doom. But this seems to, this task seems to be rele relegated to a special class of angels. Um, the other, the other um, point that I would like to raise in, in arguing that this is not Jesus Christ is that in verse five, John writes, then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and land. So he was very emphatic that this was an angel because he is familiar with who Jesus Christ is. So he would have said so if he was, if it was somebody familiar to him. He would not have just have said an angel. Let's just write this down. 10, 5, he really is described as an angel. I really agree with that. I really agree with that statement. Uh, the other thing too is that how how is Jesus in these visions, how is Jesus described? So if we're looking at Jesus's description, he's described as um, this exalted risen Lord. So we see that in 1, 9 to 20. And then he's also described as the, the conquering lamb this is five chapter five so 
I, I really, I really believe I, I agree with, I agree with Raul that this is just an angel. Now with those things being said, I do think that the voice, the voice that's coming from heaven is Jesus Christ's voice. Uh, typically, typically the voice, if it's coming from the creatures, if it's coming from an angel, it's declared as such. And from the last, from last week, let me just go back to last week, or I shouldn't say last week, last time. We talked about how, yeah, so I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven sunders have said. And so in 1, 9 to 20, we also see Christ commanding him what to write and what not to give. So, so this voice, at least, you know, it's my interpretation that it would be Christ and he's commanding him what to, what to reveal and what not to reveal. And that's so interesting because the whole title of Revelation is the, re the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Christ is being revealed. He's also telling John what to reveal and not to reveal. So I really think that the voice here is that's where Christ is present in this voice. Okay. And the voice, of course, is coming from, is coming from heaven. So this is, this is a description and this is the source. Description and specifically source. So where does the source, where does the voice originate? It originates in heaven. Okay. Any other comments or questions you want to add? Just raise your hand and then I'll mute myself and, and you can talk. Any other questions or comments? Those are very valid points. I, I agree. I, I, I'm starting to believe it now. I agree. I, that's why I was kind of on the fence. So really, this this messenger, um, you could argue, has been given, you know, great authority to act on Jesus's behalf, right? No, I, I like what you're saying to act on his behalf because ultimately the angel is he's acting as a messenger for Jesus Christ. So in one sense. It's, 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 uh, it, we're splitting hairs, you know what I'm saying? Because the messenger is acting on behalf of, as an ambassador, as a messenger for Jesus and ultimately God the Father. So, um, yeah, excellent, excellent point and clarification there. So I, I think that's good. Okay, um, let me just make a couple more comments here. You, you, can, you can chime in. Okay, so we have a command here for him to take the scroll. Now let's discuss for a second the scroll. So this is what he's supposed to take. Um, have we seen this scroll before? What does, what does it signify? What is significant? Um, I have some comments here from my own study. Uh, have we seen a scroll before in Revelation? And if so, where and what did we identify it as containing? So we're, we're looking to do a, a, like a word study uh, expansion on this idea of scroll. I think in... Uh, in five, in chapter five, where the scroll was mentioned. But um, yeah, you're right to focus on the scroll because I have a question also on the scroll. Um, here we're talking about a small, small scroll, and the the the, one, the scroll we talked about previously was uh, a large sealed scroll, and this one is an open scroll. This 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 here is open. The one that was previously mentioned was sealed, I think, seven times uh, with seven seals, I think. No, that's an excellent comment, Raul. So, so the, the similarities, this is similar to chapter five. So this is, this is similar. This is the, the idea of scroll. This word is also, it's, it's from the word Bible. We get biblios. It's so it's, so um, it's the same word. It's the same word being used. Okay. Um, so that's a parallel with chapter five. There is a difference because this one is called small, whereas the one in chapter five is written. It's written on the, the front and back and with, uh, within. So that would be a difference as far as the opening, uh, Raul is correct that the ones, the, the, the scroll in chapter five is sealed but if you notice so this is why this is gets debated right if you notice that after the opening of after the breaking of the seals 
uh, consequently, that scroll must also be open to get to the contents. And so the, the seven trumpets are in fact the, 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 the content of the scroll. So comparing the two, um, both are, um, are opened. So this, the, 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 is everyone tracking there with me? So once you have the, the seals br broken, the, the scroll is in fact open. So there's huge debate here. And a lot of people think it's the same scroll. And some people say it's different because it's small. So really what people will come away with is this is, that's, that's, the, that's the deciding factor that the, the small suggests it's different, okay? So good. So what about the contents now? What was the content of the scroll in chapter five? And although we don't know what the content is here, we can really, we can really, um, we have a good idea. Um, what is, what is the content here? What's the content? Anyone? Comparing it with chapter five. So we identified we identified the content being number one. This was the the big idea was consummation, uh, consummation of all things. This is God's plan, right? And then number two, this includes judgment. and salvation, right? So we can at least say that this scroll probably contains, it probably contains something within this idea because, um, well, let's look at the, let's look at the, let's look at the rest of the passage to see, to see if that's the case. So we want to be, we want to be Asking the question, what is the content here? What is the content here? We want to be asking that question, okay? And we have, we have an idea uh, because of the previous scroll, okay? Any questions or comments? Is that making sense? If I cut out and you miss something from me, just, just raise your hand and, and ask a question or make a comment. Does anyone want to add? So Tim, where did you get the, the content of the little scroll? I don't, I don't see it on chapter 10. Um, of the content of the uh, scroll. It's just, it's just your assumption, the consummation of all things in judgment is just your assumption or? Oh, yeah, no, great question. So so I at this point, so let me be clear here. This This is with, this is from chapter five. This is from chapter five. And so I'm saying, so, the, the, it's the same word being used, okay? So I'm, I'm, sus I'm suspecting that the content's going to be very similar as chapter five, but you're, you're right. We haven't yet been told what is the content. I think in this passage, we're going to really have a clue as to what the content is. Um, and we're gonna, talk about, we're gonna talk about that more, okay? So at this point, this content is what we had determined in chapter five. And then we're going to look at if we see this as as similar uh, a similar scroll, which it has to be. Um, um, let's look to see um, because there's he's gonna John is going to experience the scroll. Okay, so so John's going to experience the scroll, maybe in his belly. So I think the I think the the being uh, eating the scroll, John's going to. To share with us, so let's let's put that on hold. Okay, uh, I just want to ma mention um, uh, with regards to um, Pastor que Pastor's question about where the little scroll was mentioned. Um, it's on um, verse two of chapter of, of chapter ten. Uh, yes, that is correct, Raúl. So, Pastor, you can look at verse two, but I'm looking at verse two, and there there isn't they, it doesn't describe what's inside the scroll. So. That's kind of the rub. That's that's the question that Pastor Noel had. Go ahead, Pastor Noel. Yeah, I I I I'm not you know that, that's a question I have. You got it. Not that uh, I, I saw the the little scroll, but like I said, it doesn't say what content. But I didn't notice that in your orange writing because the screen is different now. I saw the chapter five, so my bad, my bad. So 
So that's it. I, I, Pastor, while you were talking, I added chapter five. <laughs> Yeah, so it wasn't there when you would ask the question. I was writing it down when you said, where are you getting that? <laughs> so I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. Fine print. It's the fine print. Uh, okay. Actually, and then, uh, let's move on here now. So the big question is, to be clear, is what is this? What is the content? And so we're we're going to be looking at, I think that the context is going to share with us what the content of the scroll is. And the precedent that we have is the scroll in chapter five. So this is the this is the the background, if that makes sense. So it's not a one to one. I think it's different, but that's that's going to provide for us the background. Okay. Um, now we have here a command. We have a command here to to go take and eat the scroll. Okay. Um, the other thing I do want to say is that this word word for scroll is also the Greek word from which we get from which we get Bible, okay? So if you're looking at a lot of commentators, and I think that this would have just been assumed, whatever else we see the content of the scroll, we should understand the, 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 the scroll to contain, in a generic sense, the word of God, or we could say God's will, okay? That's from looking at, at the, the big picture of Revelation, that's looking at this word for Bible. That's looking at the content of the previous scroll as well. So we can say that the scroll it is it contains God's will or God's word. Generally speaking, we still don't have the specific content yet, but we can at least say that for sure it's the word of God. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there's this command to go and take the word of God, um, to take the scroll and to do something with it, okay? So it does seem to me that um, we're moving towards, again, maybe you disagree with this. I'm gonna write this down and let's think about this, but there seems to be this uh, starting, we're starting to see this idea of this prophetic commissioning. And we're gonna see more of this in the context, okay? So we're in the, to, 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 uh, we'll come back and review the big picture of revelation at the end but i we're kind of moving towards this prophetic commissioning in some ways i'm setting you up maybe you disagree with me fair enough but i want us to be thinking along this lines as we look at the context and i think it's going to become clear uh to us so then so then uh john here in verse number nine so i went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll and he said to me take it and eat it uh, it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. Okay, so um, I think this really tells us, it gives us more clues to what the content is. So let me just put a big picture here. Here we have a, 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 an action on the, on the behalf of, of John. He, he, he goes to the angel. So I went to the angel so we could also talk about the idea of, we can talk about the idea of obedience. He is obeying the voice from heaven. Um, uh, and if this is a commissioning, it, it seems to be moving in that direction. So he, he then asks him again to uh, give him the scroll. So there is a, a, a action number two. And then there is going to be, this is a, uh, a statement. Uh, this is like a response. So the response is, what is John going to do with this little scroll? Okay, what is John going to do with the little scroll? And there is this, uh, there is a command here. Okay. There is a command here to take and to eat. Take and to eat it. So it's like, okay, you're going to eat the scroll. That's kind of, that's bizarre, okay? When you actually look at this word here, I, I, I studied this word eat, and literally it's not the normal Greek word for eat. It, the, the literal word is devour. 
So it's a it's it's like a a a, 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 a strong word to like consume to devour. So I, I don't think eat is a good translation here. I think you should be take and devour it. If you look at other translations, perhaps another translation will have this word devour, but um, um, it's not to take a taste. It's not to just partially consume. It's to consume it, to consume fully. Consume fully and completely. And then look at what's going to happen here. So then there's, there's a prophecy here. There's a prophecy here concerning what will happen, okay? Look at the actions. It's going to make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet. So the result of, of the stomach is going to be, this is the, the state, this is the object, um, this is the location here. This is the location. And then this is the state here. So let's talk about this. I've kind of set you up. I have really kind of set you up for, uh, so he's going to eat the scroll. I've talked about this being the word of God. Now, just thinking for a second, let's put aside the part one, which is make your stomach bitter. Um, Luigi, okay, let me just finish my thought, then you can, you can make a comment. So the question I want to ask, and Luigi, you can answer the question, or you, can, you can make a different comment, is what, do we have any precedent for something being sweet as honey? So sweet, sweet as honey is a very interesting comparison and imagery. So do we have any precedent in, in, in scripture for this? Let me go ahead and mute. Yeah, so I have a couple of things. Um... The, the reason why I brought up, I raised my hand initially was the command to take and eat. You had brought up the Greek for it being devour. Now, is that the same translation as at the Last Supper when Jesus said to take and eat? Um, so if it is, then there's obviously a, a Eucharistic aspect to this whole thing. And that would kind of go towards your, your point about sweet as honey. But at the same time, I do recall in a scripture, I believe it's Ezekiel 3, where the prophet Ezekiel was told to take and eat a scroll, right? Okay, so number one, excellent connection with the Lord's Supper. I just took a quick peek, and it's a different word. So it's a different word than the Lord's Supper, at least in the one context I looked in, in Luke in Luke 22. So. Um, it's not the same, but there is a huge connection with Ezekiel. There is a huge connection with Ezekiel, with Ezekiel 2. So you, 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 hit, a, you hit a gold mine with Ezekiel chapter 2. And, and we're going to go there because that, because that really kind of is going to move us towards looking at what is the content here. So Ezekiel 2 is going to help us looking at the content if we can make us more specific content. Um, so you hit the jackpot here, uh, Luigi, you get the gold star. Ezekiel is, is, is the background context for this. Yes. Now um, let's go, let's go to in your mouth will be sweet as honey. So let's turn in our Bibles. I'll, I'll turn there on the screen. Let's go to, let's go to, to, to Psalm, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, famous passage for God's general revelation and special revelation. So I'm just going to read Psalm 19, and you tell me if this is a connection here. The heavens declare the glories of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has sent, set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So verses one to six is God's 
natural revelation, how he reveals himself through nature. It, it, the, the, the voice has been proclaimed in all the earth. And then the second half of 19 is the special revelation, the law of the Lord. And so this is the word of God. Now, this is the special revelation. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Watch this. Here we go. More to be desired are they than gold, much, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So if you are, uh, if you are a, a, a Christian Jew, if you are someone that is in tune with the Old Testament, when I saw this in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. I was like, ah, Psalm 19. And so the idea here is this word of God. The word of God is sweeter than honey. There is a strong connection here that cannot be missed if we are in tune with the Old Testament. So, so we're getting somewhere concerning the content. 100% the content of the scroll contains the word of God. In the mouth, it's as sweet as honey, okay? Any pushback or is everyone tracking there with me? Let me just give you, give you a moment to react. If you want to raise your hand, make a comment. Um, I, I hope that we can be in agreement there on that. Let me just mute myself for a second. Okay, so, so let's, let's move now to this idea of, so we, we can really be emphatic that the scroll contains the word of God. In the mouth of John, it's sweet. Something else we need to note here, that, to simply say, eat it and consume it without understanding the spiritual significance would be offensive to the word of God. Because it's not simply eating. The idea of eating in Psalm 19, the, it's, it's, it's uh, meditating and obeying, okay? So for us just to see this action by John as in its physical and not pick up on the symbolic meaning, especially in the context of Revelation, is offensive to the text. This idea of John eating the scroll and consuming all of it, it it's not simply a just eat it. Okay. It, it's sweet. And then it's bitter. It's that it's, he's consuming its contents, meditating upon it, and then recognizing the significance. And then we're going to get to where um, the outworking of it. And so just to give you a, 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 a sneak peek, verse 11 says he's going to prophesy. So this is moving from John is going to be eating it, meditating upon the contents of the scroll consuming it and allowing it to affect him, coming to an understanding of it, and then prophesying, okay? And so this is where it moves from the mouth to the stomach. The stomach is bitter. So if something makes your stomach bitter, um, let me ask the question, what does that, um, what is the idea there? Is the content positive or negative? Someone ask a question, uh, answer the question, would we suspect that the content of the scroll would be positive or negative if in the stomach it becomes bitter? Would we not have to say that this is a this is a, a negative, a negative content? Uh, the the expression in the in the US, all of us have heard it, we are um, sick to our stomach. sick to our stomach. So we hear news. And when we understand the news, we become sick to our stomachs. So for example, I remember when I saw the news uh, of the collapse building in Miami, when we saw the news here, I was sick to my stomach. Because when you look at the pictures, you hear the reports, you just know that pretty much probably everyone has passed away. No one's going to really make it out. And then there was a fire. There was a lot of rain. You just, you felt sick to your stomach because you recognized what has transpired and what the message is telling us. Um, the other two other things where I was very sick to my stomach 
was the news that Yolanda had hit Takloban. When I saw the videos and I heard the news, I was sick to my stomach because I knew that so many people had passed away. Um, and then the other time that I really, it was really significant for me was when we, I was, I still remember being in, in history class and we heard the news that the World Trade Centers were hit by airplanes. And you instantly knew that there was such this terrible event had transpired. And there's other, there's other instances we can, we can, we can um, uh, identify. And so what our modern day stomach was made bitter, we could say we were sick to our stomachs. And so this is a very bad, a very bad message. Not that it's morally bad, but that the content is terrible news. Back to your point about it, this being uh, like a prophetic call. Could, you, could it also mean something like, you know, another time, uh, other ways that you could be sick to your stomach is when you're full of nerves, right? And maybe this prophetic call isn't necessarily something that's going to be easy for John to do. And maybe that's, that's what it could be as well. The fact that he knows that it's a, it's a, it's a, a large call and, you know, is it something that he's able to do? It's both and Luigi, both the content is sick in his stomach and also the fact that he is going to have to, because we're coming back to this prophetic, we're coming back to this um, prophetic commissioning here. So he is going to have to share this news. He recognizes that he's going to have to share the news because if it was just, hey, this is what's in the, the, the scroll, there are no nerves, right? Okay, that's the message. But the fact that he is, this is typical with other prophetic commissionings where he's to take the word of God, he's to understand it, and then he's to prophesy about it. And that's where this is moving, okay? This is where it's moving. All right. And so I think it's a both and Luigi. I, 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 that's a great point. And I think it's a both and. And so what we have here then is that this is just what we could say here is he obeys, obeys and does. He, he, he takes the little scroll. He ate it and it was sweet as honey in his mouth. But when he had, his, when he had eaten it, it made his stomach bitter. And so it, he just obeys um, what was happening. So then let's come down here to the conclusion, okay? So, uh, and I was told, and I was told, I, I, I am actually very disappointed in the, um, the, the, the ESV translation, not because, because, this, because what this misses, misses out. Literally, it's they said, to me. So I don't like I was told because it doesn't convey the idea of they includes both the voice and the angel. So, so at a, a certain level, maybe the angel is Jesus. And it's just the imagery here, right? Because they told me, they told me, what did they tell him? You must prophesy. So this here is yet another command. And this is, if ever you were unsure about this being a prophetic commissioning, literally, you must prophesy. And then the object of the prophesying, so the, ob the, the object of the prophesying is to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, now, Making the connection, though, with the bitterness, this is not a good message. And from, from our previous studies, especially in chapter 6, in chapter 7, Nibot, let, me, let me just go back and let me read to you. Remember, there was the terrible trumpets. And then remember what they said about the, the terrible trumpets here? Let me just let me bring up the, the trumpets, the conclusion from the trumpets here, because we can't forget about the previous statements. Reading Revelation without the broader context is really, it's, it's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake. So look at the end of chapter nine. This is after 
This is after they had all of the terrible suffering from, from these, these, this demonic horde coming out of the bottomless pit. Remember, there's two categories. There's the, the category of those that are sealed by God, the church, and those that, are, uh, that, that, that aren't sealed. Later, we'll see that they have the seal of, of the beast or the seal of Satan. But look at verse 20, 9 verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze, stone and wood, which cannot seal uh, see, hear, or walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or, or thefts. Then I saw another mighty angel. Okay, so, so um, this is the previous context that we can't miss. And so these people, these people here, to be clear, did not repent from their sin, according to Revelation chapter 9. Even after the, the trumpets, I believe there was uh, four trumpets. Um, maybe there's five trumpets already. I forget. But with those judgments, they have not yet repent. And so now John is recommissioned. John is recommissioned again to prophesy uh, to these many peoples, nations, and languages, and kings concerning their sin and rebellion. So let's go now. We're almost done. Let's go now to, to Ezekiel 2, because that was the, that this is the context of eating a scroll in the Old Testament. And what, what uh, Luigi said is spot on. So let's go to... Um, Ezekiel 2, verses, verses 8. But, so let's look at the word of the Lord. But for you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not, uh, be not rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I look, behold, a hand stretched out to me, behold, a scroll of a book was in it. He spread it before me and it had writing on the front and the back. And there were written words of lamentation, mourning, and woe. And he said to me, son of man, eat whatever you find here, eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So this here again is a, a prophetic commissioning. And we always have to remember that fundamentally a prophet is just a a mouthpiece of God who's going to speak his message. And in this context here, it's a message of judgment. Okay? And so looking at Ezekiel 2, verses 8 through 3, 1, um, and also here, I didn't mean to cut, cut, cut myself off here, but you also have um, your belly. Um, it's going to be sweet as honey. And so there's so many parallels here. So, um, Coming back to, to, to the conclusion here is that John has to proclaim a message of judgment to the people for their lack of repentance, their lack of turning from their sin, and it's not going to be good. And there is this nerves here. There is this, uh, there is these nerves here. So what I want is your assignment for next week is to read ahead to Revelation 11 in context. So I want you to read Revelation 11 in the context of Revelation 9 through 11. I want you to read this because when you see the movement here, there is this prophecy within the context of these judgments, and it doesn't end well for even those that are going to be prophesying, okay? It's not going to end well, all right? Um, Let's go ahead and let's just, by way of um, any application that you can reflect upon here, what are your thoughts? I have some thoughts I want to share, but, but let's go ahead and let's just talk about some application. This is more of a negative passage um, for sure. There is some hope in this passage as well. But let's talk, what is your application from this study? What are your thoughts Let's just take a moment here. Oh, thank you, Tim. I can just I cannot just take it out of my mind. I've been keep on thinking why the scroll would taste like honey, and then when it 
when it it swallowed and it become bitter or sour in my translation here. Is it that if I understand you correctly, is it because the the con the content of the scroll to be prophesied is very sickening because it's really full of uh of woes and, and judgment and curses. Is that, am I making sense there? Is that what I'm, am I, am I get it right, Tim? Yeah, so so think about how, you know how we eat something, like we eat something spicy, it's so tasty in the mouth, and then you have the upset stomach later, <laughs> right? So things can be tasty in our mouths that, so you have the, the, physical, the physical imagery that's pointing to the, the, the spiritual truth. So you're, you're spot on, pastor. But so just think we eat, we eat, then we digest. Diba? So it breaks down. So, so spiritually speaking, John receives the word. God's word is always, it's, God's word is always sweeter than honey. So the, the law of God is sweeter than honey, even the honeycomb. But then when you digest it or you understand, you understand or you comprehend. So I, I'm just um, filling in the gap. But what you're saying, Pastor, is, is spot on. So once you come to the comprehension of what it means, it becomes bitter. So this is, this is sweet. And then in the stomach, it's, it's bitter, right? So we could, even, we could even eat something, Pastor. We could even, uh, or, or all of us, we could even eat something that's so tasty and it's mixed with cyanide. So there's a drop of cyanide in my wife's amazing birthday cake for Carmichael. I eat that cake so sweet. It's just amazing. But there's that drop of cyanide. And then when it goes into my stomach, I die. You see what I'm saying? So, so there is that receiving and then the, the comprehension. Um, excellent clarification, Pastor. I think you're tracking on there. I just want to, I just want to make this, this, uh, this picture here so we really we really um we understand the spiritual this is uh symbolism going on here excellent sorry your hand was raised that's why okay see anyone else want to add anyone else want to add or make a make a this is a harder passage this is definitely a harder passage um but we can't ignore it we have to be like john we have to receive it even with the bad the the, the negative connotation um Anyone else want to add? If not, I, I have some some comments. I I, I can application I, I can make here, but I want to give anyone the opportunity to, to share their their thoughts. Okay, it's getting late here, so let, let me just go ahead. I'm going to actually share this with all of you here. So what I did was, I created a, a handout for this specific passage. So if everyone can see my screen, this is a handout. So this the outline kind of gives us the location, the the big the big picture idea. I have some observations and some questions here. There's some resources that you can do further studying on and some tools, various analyses here. Um, I'll be trying to do this more and more with us so that we can, um, we can, we can um, better understand. And then you can also take this type of study and do it yourself. My desire is really that, that you could do this study on your own in another passage of scripture. So let's just go down here um, to the application portion. Um, application here. So I just had several application. Um, um, I'll, I'll first give the, the summary. I'm going to give the first the summary here, and then we'll do the application. I hope everyone can see that here. Um, so the exegetical summary is this. Jesus commissions John to take, to receive, to understand the word, and then declare it to the nations, that is many tongues and especially kings. This is not a good message. It is a message of judgment because they refuse to repent of their sin and submit to the lordship of the lamb. And so there, I think that's a summary statement of, of what's going on here. And then just some application that for us to think about. Um, number one, we must listen to the voice of Jesus. So maybe that goes without saying, but here John listened, even though he didn't understand. Um, and so fundamentally, are we submitted to the lordship of Jesus and do we obey his voice? Um, number two, not every part of God's word is positive. Some parts are very hard. Some people will say, well, let's just focus on the positive aspects. And we should focus on the positive, but we should also focus on the negative. Remember, we are followers. We, we don't have a right 
to pick and choose what's palatable, pun intended, what's palatable for our mouth. We have to receive all of it and we have to accept all of it. Um, number three, we cannot choose what part of the message to give. So this was a negative message and John had to, had to give it. Uh, John, John had to receive it and then also to give it. Number four, prophecy is not just for Christians, but for all people. So John was going to prophesy to people that, that were not believers, that, were, that did not submit to the lordship of Jesus. And then lastly, um, heaven is sovereign over earth. And so this message comes from heaven. The judgments are coming from heaven. And so these are just some applications I think that we can take away with this. It's more negative of a passage. Does anyone else want to add or, or make a comment before we close? It's getting late here tonight. Does anyone else want to add or make a comment? I'll just open up the table, the, the floor for anyone. I think your I think your number two application is is what I was looking for regarding, you know, the scroll tastes like honey, but then in the stomach it's bitter. You know, I was maybe I was thinking, you know, the 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 word I think becomes bitter to anyone whenever they're going to say, they're going to rebuke someone or they're going to correct someone using the word. It's never going to be easy, but you have to say it, you know. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's like this. It's like a, I cook something and, I, I'm, and it's delicious, so I give it to everyone. Oh, they taste good. But now I cook something which is bitter, but it, it's the truth. Let's say I have to tell someone about the truth. It's going to be bitter. It's got to be sour, but I have to do it. You know, am I making sense there? No, that you're, you're dead on. I, I agree. I agree with that, Pastor. I think that's a great, that's, and I think that's the main point of this. If, if we were to accent all the application, I think that what you're sharing in point two is really the accent. Yeah, good. Go, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Luigi. I was just thinking, uh, maybe the, a better term, I don't know if this would make sense, would be instead of just bitter, bittersweet ah, it's something you know, it's something yeah. that is like you said it's very hard to say because you know it, but it, it's it has to be said right yeah so it's bittersweet no that's good i like that i like that that's uh that gets a hand clap <laughs> anyone else want to add go ahead let's just anyone else want to add no pressure yeah it's just uh you know for us pastors or any one of us we emphasize the grace of god when we preach the gospel right the love, the, the grace of God, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, no, no, no favoritism whatsoever. It's, it's for everyone. But, but looking at this revelation about the prophecy, you know, yeah, God is gracious, but he is serious about his judgment. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's the, the Peter sweet there. You know, it's sweet because it's the grace of God. We talk about the love of God for God so loved the world, you know, gave his only son. And then the bittersweet is like, well, if you ignore it, this is what's going to happen to you, you know? Well, because in the Old Testament, the prophets, they had to prophesy and many of them died. They, they, they were, Jeremiah was sawn in half. They suffered at the hands of, of evil kings, even God's own kings, the kings of Israel. The kings of Israel persecuted the prophets of God. Elijah was persecuted by Ahab and Jezebel. And so um, this is, you're, you're right that with the coming of Christ, there is the grace of God. And we need to emphasize that 1000% preach the good news. But part of the good news is the, 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 the call to repent of our sin. And those who don't repent, then we warn them of judgment. If you refuse to repent, you will warn them of judgment. And so there is that negative message that's hard for all of us to share. It, it's hard. And, and sometimes it, it's very difficult. Um, but we have to do it. So excellent point, Pastor. This does accent the, the, the hard message that needs to be given, but I want to stress that heaven is sovereign over earth, and we should not fear the reactions of those who would not agree with the message. We should only fear Jesus, and um, we're in his grace. We're in unmerited favor. And so um, if we preach the message, the unadulterated, pure message that's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb, um, there, we, we, we have no fear. We, we, um, and so that's really a challenge for us today to, to, to preach and to live out the unadulterated word of God 
and there is judgment for those who refuse to submit to his lordship. And so um, this theme continues into chapter 11. So I really encourage you, if you have time this week, maybe I'll try to post a reminder. Read sequentially, read chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, and you can really see how this is this is a story here. This is, this is happening, and, and th this negative message is received poorly. And so um, I think it'll really bring new, uh, new understanding to this passage um, to all of us. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Pastor Noel, and um, thank you for your time, and I, I hope that the internet was a little bit better with all our videos off. So um, thank you, Pastor Noel.